Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's, nice to see, uh, it's nice to see some people in the audience. Uh, thank you all for coming. So my presentation is going to be on the use of cold water immersion and how this might influence our adaptations to exercise as we use it as a recovery modality. So it's great honor and great opportunity for me to be presenting here today and this is um, and on this topic as well because cold water immersion currently is one of the most performed recovery modalities. So these days you can find almost anyone in a cold water bath. Top top sports teams, Andy Murray after winning the Wimbledon, the great Usain Bolt, Mo Farah, and even me sometimes. <laughs> so apart from being one of the most practiced model, cold water immersion is also one of the most researched recovery modality. So the first study on recovery cold water immersion was in 2004, and this was the study by Lane and Wenger. So since then. We've had a steady increase in the number of publications in this area. So at the moment, we have more than 160 publications on recovery cold water immersion, and more than 30 of them were in the last two years. Um, these are not official numbers. It's just numbers from me doing a quick search on PubMed. Yeah. So a lot of these publications have been dedicated towards understanding the mechanisms surrounding cold water immersion, which we have reviewed in detail quite recently, if you're keen to know more. But the issue is, at the moment, there is less than 10 publications investigating the effect of recovery cold water immersion on adaptations to exercise. So this is a very small, very niche area, and it's a very important one as well, given how popular cold water immersion is. And in my humble opinion, on top of the limited information, this, the information there is not well interpreted amongst the scientific community and it's definitely not well disseminated to the practitioners as well. So I think it's a good idea, um, a good opportunity to have this discussion at the moment. So the post-exercise environment is a very busy one. You've got a lot of changes taking place, and then and a lot of these changes um, drive the signaling that ultimately leads to adaptation specific to the exercise stimulus. So how cold water immersion might influence some of these adaptations stems from our early studies where we show a decrease in muscle metabolism and blood volume following cold water immersion. Okay, so this is the lines in the red box here are the control ones, and then the lines in the blue box, they're decreasing. So those are with cold water immersion. So cold water immersion reduces muscle blood volume. And then this is uh, oxygenation. So uh, lower, higher oxygenation with cold water immersion. So cold water immersion reduces muscle metabolic activity. So in follow-up studies, we showed a decrease in femoral artery blood flow and vascular conductance following for a 60-minute period following cold water immersion. So in this graph here, the higher lines are the, one, the lines in the red box are the control conditions, and the lines in the blue box are the cold water, uh, cold water immersion conditions. So same profile with vascular conductance. So given that cold water immersion can limit some of these changes, how would that influence signaling and how would that influence subsequent adaptations? So the first study to address this question was the study by Yamani and colleagues. So these guys trained people for four weeks and after four weeks of training, oh, trained people for four weeks, after each training session, the subjects immersed one leg into a cold water bath for 40 minutes, it's five degrees as well. Five degrees as well. And before and after training, they perform one-legged grid exercise test to exhaustion. And they found that performance time and VO2 max was improved during single leg cycling in the control leg, but there were no improvements in the cool leg. And these uh, differences between conditions were significant. So their take-home message was cold water immersion is detrimental to muscle aerobic adaptations to exercise. So this was a worrying take home message given how popular cold water immersion was. So we focused on how cold water immersion might influence mitochondrial biogenesis because that's the hallmark muscle adaptation to exercise. So mitochondrial biogenesis refers to an increase in various mitochondrial proteins including your respiratory chain complexes, uncoupling proteins, 
enzymes of the TCA and beta oxidation cycles. So although the mitochondrion has over 1,000 protein subunits, but only 5 to 10% are coded in the mitochondria, coded and manufactured in the mitochondria. So the remaining 90-95%, they are encoded in the nucleus, and then they get translated in the cytosol, and then they get transported into the mitochondria for assembly. So the PGC1-alpha has been uh, identified as the master regulator of the mitochondrial biogenesis program. So once activated, it translocates to the mitochondria and nucleus, and then it forms, it binds with the transcription factor and uh, the DNA complex, and there it regulates the transcription of uh, mitochondrial genes. The AMPK, P38, CAMK, and P53 are some of the upstream activators of PGC1-alpha, and all of them are quite robustly activated by exercise. So what we also found was that PGC1 was a cold sensitive protein. It was first discovered in this study investigating mechanisms of non-shivering thermogenesis. And in this study, they found that uh, PGC and, uh, PGC1 was robustly increased by cold exposure. And once expressed, it regulated the expression of uncoupling proteins. So since cold exposure and exercise can independently upregulate PGC1, we hypothesized that uh, in contrast to Yamani's early work, we hypothesized that post-exercise cold water immersion might enhance exercise-induced mitochondrial biogenesis. So we did this study here where we exercised people to exhaustion and after exercise, they immersed one leg into a cold water bath, maintained at 10 degrees, and we took muscle biopsies before exercise, after immersion, and three hours after immersion. So there was a dramatic decrease in muscle, temp muscle temperature following um, cold water immersion. And this change in muscle temp likely resulted in an increase in PGC1-alpha. We also saw strong um, time effects with VEGF as well as strong time effects in an isoform of nitric oxide synthase. So small note, VEGF is the vascular endothelial growth factor. So that's the main protein uh, regulating the increase in capillary density following exercise. It's also implicated in a host of other vascular adaptations as well. So our early findings here are supported by this study by Jew and Rob Allen and colleagues. We're using similar sort of exercise and cold water immersion protocol. They showed an increase in uh, PGC1-alpha gene expression as well as VEGF gene expression. And they went further as well because they also showed that cold water immersion alone was able to increase uh, PGC1-alpha PGC as well as VEGF gene expression. But these were all acute studies looking at gene expression, which is at best a snapshot of what could happen if cold water immersion was continued over time. So we did a longer term study where we trained people for four weeks. And after each training session, they did a one-legged immersion protocol. And we found that we found increased expression and activation of P38 and AMPK. So if you recall, these were upstream factors of pgc one alpha. We also saw an increase in PGC1-alpha protein as well as other proteins uh, specific to the mitochondria. And we also saw an increase in uh, protein subunits representative of respiratory complex uh, 1 and 3. 1 and 3. Sorry. 1 and 3. So, based on these studies, the take-home message was exercise-induced mitochondrial biogenesis is enhanced by cold water immersion. So recall in the earlier slide, we, we showed that VEGF was enhanced by cold water immersion. So our study showed that the study by Ju and Rob, they did a better job of showing it. So we did a follow-up looking at changes in microvascular function following exercise and cold water immersion. So this is unpublished stuff or stuff that we uh, saw soon to publish or soon to be submitted stuff. Yeah. So microvascular function was assessed by recently published methods by McKay and colleagues. So basically with the NIRS, you establish a baseline period and then you do a five minute arterial occlusion and then you do a cuff release and then you look at the reperfusion. So there are a number of variables with, uh, with this measurement. You can look at the uh, occlusion uh, amplitude, the recovery amplitude, the burst, but the most important variable would be the recovery slope, which in some of other st the other studies have shown to be highly related to FMD measurements. Yeah. 
So we found that. So we found all our variables: the occlusion amplitude, recovery amplitude, and recovery slope. They were all enhanced by exercise. Okay, all enhanced by exercise. But we saw that the recovery slope was significantly more enhanced in cold water immersion compared with controlled condition. The cold water immersion enhances mitochondrial biogenesis and also enhances microvascular function. So despite some of these encouraging results, there were some concerns regarding the use of cold water immersion. And the first of them was related to HSPs. So PGC1 interacts with heat shock factor 1 and transcribes heat shock proteins. So heat shock proteins play a key role in the transportation and assembly of mitochondrial proteins. So there was some concern how cold water immersion might influence this process because heat shock factor and heat shock proteins, they are upregulated by heat, which is a byproduct of exercise. And with cold water immersion, you're quite effectively taking away that heat. But this study here showed that heat shock factor was enhanced following cold water immersion after four weeks of training. So heat shock factor enhanced with cold water immersion. They saw no changes in HSP72 though. That's one of the main HSP studied and suggested that HSPs, other HSPs uh, might have been upregulated. Okay. The second issue was with mitochondrial uncoupling. So with cold induced mitochondrial biogenesis, you get an increase in mitochondrial content but you also get a strong upregulation in uncoupling proteins. So with uncoupling proteins, what they do is that they allow the passive leakage of proton back down the gradient, back down into the uh, inner uh, outer mitochondrial membrane, so which reduces the proton gradient and the drive and the potential to synthesize ADP. So with this, what you might get is, so oxygen consumption is uncoupled with ATP production, right? So what you might get is decreased mitochondrial efficiency. So you can have both at the same time. You can have an increase in mitochondrial content at the same time decrease in mitochondrial efficiency. So that was one of the concerns. But this study by Broach, James Broach, they showed no differences between uh, regular cold water immersion or no cold water immersion in mitochondrial respiratory measurements. Okay, so state one, to state five respiration, no differences. Still on Broach's study, because it's an interesting one. So these guys looked at the influence of cold water immersion on 30 second bicycle sprints. And they found no effect of cold water immersion on AMPK or P38. So this is in contrast to what we showed earlier. They also showed no cold water immersion effect on PGC1 alpha. And this is in contrast to what in others have showed as well. Um, but they did show an increase in P53 and P53 target genes. So these target genes, they are related to mitochondrial adaptations, but not specifically mitochondrial biogenesis. Okay. And in part two of their study, they looked at regular cold water immersion for six weeks of bicycle sprint training, and they found no effect of cold water immersion on pgc one alpha, P53, or any indices of mitochondrial biogenesis. So it's quite different, their findings, um, their findings and uh, compared with the others. So we've got studies here. So these studies here have shown enhanced mitochondrial adaptations following cold water immersion. This study here by Broach showed no effect of cold water immersion on mitochondrial adaptations. And we all use sort of similar sort of cooling protocol. Okay, it's all about there. So we are thinking the sprints uh, there might be something with the sprints uh, to explain the disparity in our results. So sprints, they are potent stimulus that might generate a strong response, a very large response. So cold water immersion, the response might be so large, the cold water immersion cannot add any more. It creates a ceiling effect. So that could be one explanation. So we have spoken about the signaling and some of the mitochondrial adaptations. So what about exercise performance? How can cold water immersion influence our adaptations to exercise performance? So we have two studies here which we have uh, visited. So in both of these studies, they reported an increase in performance uh, following training with cold, water of, uh, with cold water immersion offering no additional benefits. And for this study here, this is despite them showing enhanced mitochondrial biogenesis and, and enhanced HSF uh, heat shock factor upregulation as well. 
So it's quite tricky, the findings. We have another study, an earlier one, by Helson and colleagues from the AIS. So they, using competitive cyclists, uh, reckon that performance was improved by cold water immersion. So if you look at their paper, so the people in the cold water immersion group tended to do better, but the stats didn't back them up entirely, so the effects were largely unclear. Okay. So quick summary, so cold water immersion enhances AMPK P38, P53 signaling, it enhances the expression of PGC1 and HSF, more research is needed on HSP72 or other HSPs, it improves microvascular function, enhances mito it enhances mitochondrial biogenesis when you're not sprinting, um, can, but are all these adaptations sufficient to induce a performance change? Uh, so that one not really at the moment. Okay. So we have spoken exclusively ab uh, about endurance exercise. What about resistance exercise? How does cold water immersion influence the adaptations to resistance exercise? So a quick overview on the regulation of muscle mass. So muscle mass is determined between the balance. Uh, it's de uh, it's de determined by the balance between protein synthesis and protein breakdown. So if you have protein synthesis in excess of protein breakdown, you have muscle growth. That's called hypertrophy. If it's the other way around, you get a decrease in muscle mass, which is muscle atrophy. So the AKT mTOR pathway is the central pathway regulating uh, protein synthesis. And once mTOR, once it's activated, uh, goes through some intermediate steps and Ultimately, uh, ultimately activates the eukaryotic initiation factor 4E and the ribosomal protein S6, leading to translation, initiation, and elongation. So with protein breakdown, you have a number of pathways. One big one is the ubiquinin proteasm system, and the main enzymes of that system is the muscle F-box protein, also known as the Trojan 1, as well as the muscle ring finger 1 protein. So in rodents, Extended cold exposure has shown to increase protein breakdown in a variety of different muscle groups. And this increase in protein degradation has been associated with the increase in the atrogen uh, gene expression and protein, as well as the MERV1 gene expression and protein content. So if you recall, these were the proteins in this part of the pathway. So there is a mechanism there, but it hasn't been really demonstrated in humans. It's a nice area for future study. So in humans then, cold water immersion following a single strength session has been shown to attenuate the activation of P70S6K there and there, as well as the ribosomal, uh, the ribosomal S6 protein over here. And recall that these were the proteins found in this part of the pathway, and these are key, key steps in protein synthesis. So in, in engineered mice with p 70 SSK knockout, they won't st uh, respond to hypertrophic stimuli. Okay, so it's a key steps, uh, crucial for this process. So in part two of the study, they looked at uh, the influence of cold water immersion during 12 weeks of strength training, and they found that cold water immersion attenuated the hypertrophy response to strength training. And over here, we have a number of strength measures. We have leg press, we have knee extension strength, we have isometric torque during knee extension, and we have rate of force development during the, uh, during the isometric uh, force production. So all of these measures were reduced with cold water, regular cold water immersion. Yeah. So a quick summary as well, on resistance training. So Regular cold water immersion reduced, uh, attenuated the P70S6K signaling, sorry, oops, and the RPS6 signaling, and these are key steps involved in muscle protein synthesis. It upregulated a Trojan 1 and MERV1 signaling, and these are key enzymes part of the ubiquinin proteasin system. So cold water immersion also attenuated muscle hypertrophy response following resistance training and also reduced the strength gain following resistance training. So if you're looking at, if you're needing recovery following recent exercise, cold water immersion cannot be the one. So if you're looking at some sort of intervention to enhance adaptations to recent exercise, cold water immersion, it's absolutely no-no. Yeah. And 
maybe you can try heat for for FYI we are investigating um, hypertrophy atrophy pathways and some mitochondrial dynamics in different models of heat stress and it's ongoing projects over AHP yeah. thank you